Okay, while they're getting it ready, all right, we're ready to go. Tomorrow night, the end of the world as you know it, bowling night, the doomsday bowling, 6 o'clock at the bowling alley. If you don't want to bowl, you can still come out and eat and have fellowship with us. It's going to be a blast. And uh, so that's at 6 o'clock Monday night, tomorrow night. And then Tuesday night, it'll be a work night for the men. We're going to just have some cheeseburgers and hot dogs and do a few projects around here and just have a time of fellowship. So if you can do that, wear your work clothes. Uh, there are several little things that needs to be done, and we're going to knock them out. Okay. Tonight, can everybody see that? Is that clear? This is the hardest subject in the world to teach, bar none. And it's because it is hard to wrap your brain around it because you've been programmed to think about things in a different way. But when we get done tonight, this will go along with last Wednesday's night, you're going to know information that you probably don't know right now so this is revelation chapter 19 part 6 but it's entitled when was jesus crucified okay so we're going to bear all these scriptures and there's probably even more but this is a plenty to prove my point so everything you've been told about it's a lie and you kind of should expect that because the father of lies is the little g God of this world. And the Bible said he deceives every nation, ours included. We're probably the worst deceived because we've been given the most truth. Look at Exodus chapter 12. Now Jesus was the Passover lamb he was the reason for the Passover. Now we're going to go back to the Passover and find out what the Passover was about. So when God was bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, there was ten plagues. The last one was the Passover. The Passover went like this, God said. On the 14th day of the first month of the year. Right there it gets confusing because the Jews have... A civil calendar, it starts in the fall. And they have a religious calendar, and it starts in the spring. Okay? So the first month in the religious calendar is called Nissan. Just like the Nissan cars, it's Nissan. Okay? On the 14th day of Nissan was the Passover. What you're going to see here is God gave them instruction. He said on the 10th day, go find a perfect little one-year-old or younger lamb. It can't have a blemish. It can't be uh, sick. It can't have a broken leg. It can't be spotted. It has to be a perfect, spotless, no-blemish lamb. Take it into your house. It's not a lamb for every person. It's a lamb for a house. Matter of fact, in the old uh, Exodus story, they were told if you're just a couple, like Rusty and Belisa or me and Peggy, you can't eat a whole lamb in one night. Well, me and Rusty, that's probably not a good example. <laughs> but anyway, if you couldn't, then you would get with another small family and you would have the Passover because every bit of it has to be eaten and no bones can be broken. Think about it. If this thing is a symbol of Jesus Christ, you can't just throw out a hindquarter to the dogs. You got to eat it all. Okay? So you pick it on the 10th. You bring it in your house. Uh, they didn't keep animals in their house like we do. And you... Observe it for four days. You make sure it's not sick. You make sure it's not lame. You observe it. So Jesus rode into town on a donkey on the 10th. 
he was examined for four days. He went to this guy. He went to Herod. And then he went to the high priest. And then he went to Pilate. They sent, Pilate sends him back to the high priest. And then he goes to the Herod. He go, he's, he's examined. He's uh, eventually looked at and declared that Pilate says, I find no fault in him. He's perfect. He rides in on a baby donkey on the 10th. He's examined for four days, and then he's crucified on Passover day while they're crucifying the Passover lambs. Okay? Now what's confusing is the, the actual feast of Passover is also called the sacrifice of Passover. And it starts on the 14th, but the animals aren't eating eaten on the 14th. They are sacrificed on Passover, the sacrifice. Before the sun goes down. When the sun goes down, then they're eaten at night, which is actually to the Jew the 15th day. Okay? So... We'll get all this. I just want to say that to get you started. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. So he just made that the first month. It shall be the first month of the year to you. See, this year it tracked just fine. But you can't start the first month Unless the barley is aviv. And that's just a Hebrew word of saying the barley is in the head ready to harvest. Because in just two weeks, they're going to harvest the first fruits of the barley. If the barley is not in the head ready to harvest, then the priests look at it and they say, the barley is not a beeb. It's not ready to harvest. So they wait till the next new moon. So they wait 30 days. This year, it was a beeb, and so the month started when it should have. Okay? I don't know why I told you that. It just muddied up a very hard subject to teach. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day, in the tenth day of the month, they shall take to them every man a, a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. You can sacrifice a goat if you don't have a sheep on Passover. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So they all kill it at the same time. Now, here's the first problem. We Western Americans read evening, and we think of night. That's not a Hebrew evening is the afternoon, what we call afternoon, okay? Because their day is ending, and when the sun goes down, their day has ended. That's the evening or the ending of their day. It's from noon to approximately six in the evening we call it evening when the sun goes down because that's the ending of our day but we're not talking about us we're talking about them so and this day shall be unto you for a memorial and you shall keep it a feast to the lord throughout your generations you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever but they didn't. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. That means 
killed. And in the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. Now, so Passover's on this day, and the first day after Passover is the, starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread. When it says that this first day there shall be a holy convocation, that means that day is a Sabbath. It doesn't matter what day of the week it falls on. So on Passover, you don't do any work. And on the first day of unleavened bread, the feast that follows the next day, the first day is a Sabbath. It's a holy convocation. It's a high and holy Sabbath, and it can fall any day of the week. It's not the weekly Sabbath that is always Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown. That weekly Sabbath is a weekly occurrence. But this high holy day of the first day of unleavened bread is a Sabbath as well. You have to remember that. Seven days later on the 21st, it's a high holy Sabbath as well. It can be any day of the week. So, this is what has confused, this is what the Catholic Church, Catholic Church was not made up of Hebrew people. And so they just made up stuff willy-nilly. And the devil had a little bit of help in it, right? So, in the first day there shall be a holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. What's that mean? Seven days after the first day. The first day is the 15th. The seventh day is the 21st day of Nisan. No manner of work shall be done in them. Not between them, but on the first day and the seventh day. Save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought you your armies out of the land of Egypt. Did you know they were armies? God calls them armies. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Okay, now, I had a thought and I forgot it. Anyway, so I want to drive that home to you that um, this is a Sabbath, a high holy Sabbath in the week of Jesus' um, crucifixion there was three sabbaths that's what trips them up that's why the catholic church told you he was crucified on friday afternoon at three but he rose again sunday morning before the sun come up but you can't get three days and three nights no way no shit not even with the new math you can't no way no way so we don't believe that and a matter of fact, we believe the devils had his hand in the confusing people, and they, of course, of course, they worship on the wrong days, and they follow after pagan practices. They call the day they claim to worship the resurrection by the name of the sexual fertility goddess. It's just pandemonium when it comes to ignorance. But tonight, I'm, I'm going to endeavor to teach you this the best way I know how. So the 10th day, you get a lamb. The 14th day, uh, you kill the lamb, and you put it in an oven. So on the 14th day, Jesus was crucified and put in a tomb. You cook this lamb over a fire. And then when the sun goes down, it's cooked long enough, and then you eat it. That, when the sun goes down, that's the 15th day. Now you, Passover's over, and you're in the feast for seven days, a feast called unleavened bread. Remember that, because it's going to be important at the end. So the feast of unleavened bread is a seven-day feast, but it comes after Passover, okay? Remember that. So Leviticus 23, 
Let's look at this real fast. This is when the law was given concerning the Passover. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. That's another word for a Sabbath day. But it's more holier than the uh, weekly Sabbath. It's a holy, high, holy convocation. Even these are my feast. Six days shall uh, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. The Sabbath, weekly Sabbath, is a holy convocation. So are these other feast days. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, we know that the Bible says that the uh, Sabbath was given to the Jews for a sign. For a sign. What was the sign? The sign was that when the 7,000th year of man begins... It'll be a thousand year day of rest. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their season. There are seven of them. There's four in the spring. Um, there's actually three in the spring, one in the summer. They are Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits. And then 50 days after Passover, what we call Pentecost or Shavuot. There are four in that season. In the fall, there are three. The four in the spring have been fulfilled to the day. The three in the fall have not been fulfilled. That's why we believe they're going to be fulfilled to the very day. So the last one is the Feast of Tabernacle. That means God tabernacling with us. I think that's when Jesus returns to earth. The first one is Rosh Hashanah. That has the hundred trumpets. Well, the Bible says on the last trump, the rapture. Well, every Jew knew what that meant. Because they blow the shofar, the lamb's horn, or the ram's horn, 99 times. Boop, 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 boop. How would you like to have that job? And then the last one's called the last trump. And they blow it. And it's really something. So we hear that as Western. And we're like, last trump? What does that mean? Every Jew says, hey, stupid, that's the last trump on the Feast of Rosh Hashanah. Anyway, I think they'll be fulfilled to the day. Okay, we'll have to live to see. In the 14th day of the first month at even. When? In the afternoon. At the ending of the day of the 14th is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month, so when the sun goes down on the 14th day, that begins the 15th day for the Jew. Their day starts with the evening, with the night, and goes to the day. Remember last week, God gave me that little nugget. God always takes you from darkness into light. That's how he reckons his days. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread comes after the Passover unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Why does he tell them to eat unleavened bread? Because when they left Egypt, they didn't have time to let it rise. God, God likes hot rolls with yeast in them. Now, before you start throwing hymnals at me, yeast and, un and leaven are two different things. Yeast and leaven are two different things. Most preachers will tell you they're the exact same thing, and that's because they're ignorant. Yeast and leaven are two different things, but they act similar. They make the bread rise. Well, they didn't have time to wait on it for a few hours to rise and then punch it down and let it rise again, you know. They had to get. So they eat... Uh, unleavened bread like a tortilla and they tell their kids in that feast man we had to get out of Egypt that's why we couldn't use you know make the good bread everything God does is to teach your children something we don't teach our kids anything watch in the first day you shall have a holy convocation first day of what unleavened bread the 15th you shall do no service work therein servile work but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day, 
Hey, guess what? The seventh day is a holy convocation too. Ye shall do no service work. It's a Sabbath. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you become into the land which I give unto you, you shall reap the harvest thereof. Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. That's where we get the idea of bringing your first fruits or bringing your tithe into the storehouse first. But honoring God first. It's called the Feast of First Fruits. And God said, when you get in the land I'm going to give you, then you start honoring me first. This is something that I don't have it in my notes. But I've always been intrigued with. So God brings all these animals on this boat and causes a flood. And it kills everything virtually except the aquatic animals and eight people that are on the boat. And when the boat lands and the water subsides, the first thing God tells them is, I want you to start taking some of those animals and sacrifice them to me. Uh, that don't, if that don't cause you to shake your head, you know, everybody says, well, they went on there two by two. Those were the unclean animals, two by two. The clean animals were put on there seven by seven. What for? Well, so when the boat landed, they could start sacrificing them. Well, first of all, they had to have something to eat. But secondly, I'm, if I say, let's say I'm a, I'm a sheep. And I'm, the, I'm one of them that gets chosen to get on the boat. And I'm looking out the little hole and I'm like, oh my goodness, man, everything else is dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I'm one that gets to live. And then I'm the first one he grabs up and cuts his throat. Think about the faith it took for Noah. Would you not have argued with God? Wait a minute now, God. You're high and lofty. You're high and lifted up. Do you really need the blood of this animal? I don't know if you remember, God. This is all there is. So it takes a lot of faith to start killing animals uh, as a sacrifice to God when there's not that many animals. Take a whole lot more faith than us giving some finances, right? And he shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow, after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. It's called the first fruit. And you shall offer uh, that day when you wave the sheaf of the lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two-tenths deal of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hen. And ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling. Well, all the people said amen. I'm glad they don't still have that rule that you don't get to eat until you bring your offering. That's pretty hard. So, look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. And I want to drive this home to you. Passover's on the 14th. Unleavened bread starts on the 15th. It runs till the 21st. Inside that is first fruits. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Why did they say that? Because of 1 Corinthians 1, 22. I've showed it to you a hundred times. I've got to show it to you again. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. Why did these Jewish leaders ask Jesus for a sign? For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews require a sign from God before they'll believe anything. So they told Jesus he had... <laughs> he had perform so many miracles it wasn't even funny and then they have the audacity to ask him for a sign what does he go on to say after they ask him 
verse 39. He says this. You've heard it before, but it's in this context. But he answered, they say, uh, Master, Rabbi, we would have you give us a sign to prove who you are. He says this. He answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Now what does that mean? To be an a adulterous group of people, it means that you've been intimate with a false god. But he says you're evil. Evil. I don't want to go past that. You're evil and you've been intimate with false gods. All false gods are evil spirits. So there's an evil spirit that has led you to ask me for a sign. And anybody that seeks after a sign is evil and adulterous. Well, Paul said Jews require a sign. Was that a good thing? No, it was evil and adulterous. To seek after a sign. Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 that tongues are for a sign. Is it evil and adulterous to seek after tongues? I think so. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall be no sign given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. He goes on to clarify, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. That's a slap in the face. He's telling a bunch of Jews that at the great white throne judgment, the men of Jonah are going to stand up and testify against them. Ninevites were hated by the Jews. First of all, they were Gentiles. Second of all, they were descendants of Nimrod. Third of all, they did atrocities to Jewish people. Jesus said in the judgment, they're going to stand up and testify against you. They repented and believed in Jonah, and here I am, the Son of God, and you won't believe me. So, three days and three nights was the duration, but the complete sign of Jonah was that Jonah died and was buried for three days and three nights and then was resurrected. Most people miss that, but he died. He did not live three days and three nights in the belly of a well. His own testimony was the bars of hell surround him. Well, he must have left his body. He died, and he was resurrected. That's the sign of Jonah Jesus was talking about. Here's where the problem arises. Go to Mark 15, verse 12. This will be a little lengthy, but you got to get it. You're going to get it. We're going to get to this in a minute. And I tried my best. I racked my brain. How can I make this simple? I think I have. And now when the evening was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath. Okay, go back to that, if you will. The Holy Spirit does this. It's a copper-headed rattle moxkin. The book will save your soul or damn your soul, depending on how you believe it. This is where they get messed up. Now, it was even it come because this is when Jesus was crucified. It's the evening. It's the evening, three o'clock, because it was the preparation. That is the day before the Sabbath. Well, every Jew will tell you that Friday, what we call Friday, is the preparation day for the Sabbath. 
It, that's what they call it, preparation day. But they call it the preparation day because you prepare your food, you prepare your animals, you put out more food, more hay, more water because the next day you can't do anything. You can talk to Diana or Lori that's went to Israel. They say that it's crazy. The whole town of Jerusalem shuts down. You can't buy anything. You can't sell anything. You can't go anywhere. There's no traffic. And those people don't even believe. So they got confused. And they said, well, Friday's the preparation day. So he must have been crucified on the preparation day. Because that's what the Bible says. And the preparation day is Friday. But they're not Jews. They're Gentiles and they don't know what they're talking about. And the devil's helping the Catholic Church out. Every day before a Sabbath is called preparation day because you got to prepare for the day when you can't do anything. So if a high holy Sabbath happens on Tuesday, guess what Monday's called? Preparation day. Watch it. And now when the evening was come, because it was the preparation that is the day before the Sabbath. And it was because you just read it. The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a Sabbath. And so is the last day. Now, Passover is sometimes called a feast. It's not usually called a Sabbath. But for that day, you couldn't do a whole lot of work. But the preparation to eat the lamb on the next day had to be made. You got to cook it before you can eat it. And it has to be cooked by an open fire because the open fire symbolizes the judgment of God that was poured out on his son. You can't, you can't heat it up in the microwave. His son was not uh, under the microwave. He was under the judgment of God, which is fire. So, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in bodily and boldly unto Pilate and craves the body of Jesus. Hang on. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> I got to tell you this. I've taught you at nauseum between the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of heaven is an earthly, physical, literal kingdom that all the Jews look to. It's that thousand year period where Jesus reigns. But the kingdom of God, the Bible says, is not meat or drink. It's not tangible. It's not physical. It's this, the kingdom of God that we're a part of. It's spiritual. We were born into a spiritual kingdom of God. But while Jesus was on the earth, no, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven were both here. But when he left, the only thing that was left was the kingdom of God. But no one had ever experienced the kingdom of God with the Holy Spirit within their body and the circumcision made with hands in Colossians 2 until after the resurrection of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit was given 50 days later, 47 days later. That's when people truly experienced the kingdom of God. See, the people in the Old Testament were saved, but they weren't born again. They were saved, but they weren't redeemed. They were forgiven, but they weren't redeemed. Their sins were set in remission, which is forgiveness, but they weren't redeemed. In other words, there was still a payment due on their sin. But if they did what God told them and they loved God and they believed in God, then he would push off their punishment for a later day. Look what this guy is waiting on. It says Joseph of Arimathea. An honorable and counselor. Which also waited for the kingdom of God. He was waiting and longing for when. The day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit was given. And God would circumcise those people's flesh away from their spirit. And quicken their dead spirits to life. And he became a part of the kingdom of God. Ah, when your eyes are open, you can't help but see it. He came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead 
And calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. How long has this guy been dead, he says. So, this, uh, it's not the weekly Sabbath. It's the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which comes the next day after the Passover. Remember? First day of unleavened bread is the Sabbath, so is the last day. Look at John 19, verse 30. It'll tell you exactly what I'm talking about. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, and remember we talked about that the other day, it was a toilet brush. They shoved a sponge with a human excrement on it in his mouth. He said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, there you go again, that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. Well, that was the day preparing for the next day was the Sabbath. Notice this in parentheses, it's a thought unto itself, for that Sabbath day was a high day. And he's letting you know, it wasn't the weekly Sabbath. It was a high holy Sabbath because it was the first day of the unleavened bread, the day after Passover. It ain't got anything to do with the weekly Sabbath. He didn't die on preparation day on Friday. He didn't raise on the first day of the week, Sunday. He died on the Passover, the 14th day of Nisan, and the next day was the first day of unleavened bread, which was a high holy Sabbath. Besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. We got to speed this up. What do they got to speed it up for? Because they need to get back and cook their lamb. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and say and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Well, yeah, because the Passover lamb could not have a broken bone. It was a high holy Sabbath. That can fall on any day of the week. Passover was a high Sabbath. Also preparation day for the first day of the feast of unleavened bread which was a high holy Sabbath. So, Jesus was crucified on Wednesday. So, what I've drawn here is the separation of our days. It's separated at midnight. Okay? So, this is, this is uh, Monday for us goes from midnight to midnight. And so I drew this little black part to represent the night time. Okay? So you got about six hours of darkness from midnight till six. You got 12 hours of daylight. Then you have six hours of darkness from around six to midnight. And then Tuesday it starts over for us. Is that clear? We reckon our day from midnight to midnight. So I drew half the night starts our new day. And you have the other half a night on the end of our day. We have 12 hours of daylight in between them. Underneath here, I tried to draw you the way that the Jews reckon their day. They reckon from sundown to sundown. So this would be what we call the first day of the week, what they call the first day of the week, actually would start on our Saturday night at sundown. Do you see what I've done? From sundown on Saturday till sundown on Sunday would be the first day of the week to the Jew. Okay? So we've got to figure this out because we know that on this first day, Sometime before the sun come up, Mary went to the tomb. Now, we don't know when, but let's just, I mean, let's just be honest. Um, I did the funeral for uh, Dave Jensen, 
And they told me he got up at 4 o'clock every day. And he went out on Highway 75. He always turned left, went to Quick Trip and got a breakfast burrito or something, and then went back to the Jensen tractor and started his day. He pulled out in front of a lady in a van, and it killed him. 4.31 in the morning. Now, I can assure you his grandson don't get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. But the older people used to. Uh, a lot of times because they had to be at work at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock, but they had to milk some cows before they went to work. My dad told me, he asked his dad one time, is there, is some, is there something that causes the milk to spoil if we milk these cows in the daylight? And his dad said, no, it's just a waste of time. You could get up a little bit early and milk the cows, and then when you get home, then they have milk again, you can milk them again. But back in this day, we know she's there before the sun comes up because the Bible tells us that. But let's pick a time. Is it five? Was she anxious? Was it four? It doesn't matter, but she's there before the sun comes up. So we know that, so that's our point of reference to go by, okay? So here we go. Uh, I'm going to try my best. So, Wednesday, Wednesday is to the um, Jewish people, it was the 14th of Nisan. It started at sundown on our Tuesday, and it went till sundown on our Wednesday, okay? Well, he's crucified right here from 9 o'clock until uh, 3 o'clock. Now, they take him off the cross at 3 o'clock. So at 9 o'clock, he goes on the cross. And at 3 o'clock, they take him down. At high noon, there's an eclipse that's going to make tomorrow look like a kindergarten class. It stayed dark for three hours. The scientists say that can't happen. But, you know, the Bible says that God stopped the sun for a whole day one time. Of course, scientists say, I know it says he stopped the sun, but what it means is he stopped the world. Well, it doesn't say he stopped the earth. It said he stopped the sun. But anyway, I digress. So this is the day, and Wednesday afternoon is they take him off the cross. We know that, and I'll show you why. They take him off because they got to get their lambs cooked and eat it here. They eat the Passover on the night, right after the sun goes down on the fifth day, or in this case, it was the 15th of the month. Okay? This is the Sabbath. This is a preparation day. So, let's try to stick with my notes or I'm going to get. So, he is um, in that week, there was a Sabbath here. Weekly Sabbath, from Friday night at sundown to Saturday night at sundown. There was a weekly Sabbath. This was the 15th, the first day of unleavened bread. That's a high holy Sabbath. A high and holy Sabbath. This was preparation day for that. Passover. Now, Here's how we can figure this out. So the Passover is on the 14th, but it's not eaten until the night of the 15th. That's the first day of unleavened bread. So he's crucified on Wednesday. He's on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. They have about three hours to get him down. So... He's in the tomb 
all of what we would call Wednesday night. You with me? And um, Friday night and Saturday night. Okay? Now, these are our splits between Friday and Saturday night, Thursday and Friday, Wednesday and Thursday. See, this part of the night is actually what we call Wednesday because it goes to 12 o'clock. And then at 12 o'clock, we say it's Thursday. But if you're looking at the Jewish, it's all one night, one night, one night. Are you still with me? And where was he? Well, we don't know, but Mary came before. And we'll say Mary. She comes there and he's already gone. But that doesn't mean he was resurrected then. It's just when they found out he had been resurrected. So, here we go. We're getting, it's getting good. So, he's already risen on Sunday. Uh, here's where the problem comes in. Look at John 20. Now, where, where was he resurrected? He was resurrected before what we would call Saturday night, but what they would call the first day. This is the resurrection, okay? I'm trying not to confuse you. Okay, John 20, verse 1. Watch this Bible. Who cares what I say? The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark. Where is that? Right here. This is the first day of the week. This is before, and it's still dark, before it turned daylight. Here we go. First day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and she seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Notice, you're in the book of John. John is the only person that refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. You wouldn't know that terminology, but John told you he was the one. He didn't want to write, she come to Peter and me. Watch what John does in this section. I think it's, I think it's hilarious. So, she runneth and cometh to Simon people and the other disciple whom Jesus loved himself and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. Oh my gosh. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple, John himself, and came to the sepulcher. Now he could have left all this out, but he doesn't. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter. <laughs> John, what's he got to write that for? What, he ain't done yet. And came first to the sepulcher. We know that John was the youngest disciple. Probably really young. Peter, a little bit older, a little bit bigger, a little bit fatter. John wants you to know that he outrun old Peter. Watch this though. He's honest. And he... Stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloth lying, yet went he not in. So he says, I outran him, but I didn't go in. I just looked in there. He's probably scared, right? Watch this. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen cloth lie. Peter's not afraid of a whole lot. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple himself. When Peter went in there, then John felt he had enough courage to go on in there. And he wants you to know, though, he did outrun him, which came first to the sepulcher, and then he saw what Peter saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the, the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now we talked about that in the 5 o'clock class. 
These jokers didn't have this thing figured out. They didn't even know, John is telling you, when they're standing in the tomb with the cloth, the linen cloth, the, ta- the, tra- the, the shroud of Turin laying there, they didn't even know that he was going to rise from the dead. Because they were kind of hard-headed like we are sometimes. He told them over and over and over. I can show you the record over and over and over, but don't raise your hand. But I know things in the Bible, and yet I don't always remember them. The Bible says he spent 40 days after the resurrection teaching them the Old Testament Scriptures. They didn't have the New Testament. Teaching them every place that the Old Testament Scriptures talked about him. And right before he ascended off this earth to go to heaven, after the 40 days of teaching from God himself, they asked him the most stupid question, are you going to set up your kingdom now? You know, Paul and Jan Crouch had the largest TV network. They probably sent more people to hell than anybody that's ever lived. They were a part of a movement called Kingdom Now. They taught that the kingdom was now. Well, they were kind of in a kingdom, but the rest of us were without the gate. They had a solid gold, lay, a gold laid, inlaid grand piano. We're lucky if we have a little Casio thing. It was a kingdom to them. He paid almost a million dollars, $480,000 twice, to keep his black um, chauffeur from writing a book and telling about their homosexual escapades. I couldn't pay somebody $58. Has any of you men ever been blackmailed by someone that they was going to tell everybody he is a homosexual? If anybody, I mean, they've done about anything they could to me, but if they tried that on me, I'd say, go tell everybody you want to. I've never been accused of that. I've been accused of everything under the sun, and most of them lies, but I ain't never been accused of that. But these disciples, they were clueless. I, I think if you get to heaven and you can watch the video of it, I think if you watch that video, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. One of the greatest events that ever happened on the earth. And one of them disciples said, are you going to start your kingdom now? And I think he just went, get me out of here, man. I'm, I can't take it no more. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again into their own home. That's something a lot of people miss. They still had their homes. People's got this idea that when Jesus called them, they was like zombies and they sold their houses, they sold their businesses, they sold everything and just followed him 24-7. That's not true. And the, and, uh, the chosen has made a good attempt to prove that. They still had homes. They still, the first thing Peter says when he's crucified, I'm going to go fishing. He must still have a boat. They still had to provide for their families. They, they actually put Jesus up. Jesus said he didn't have a home, but they had homes. They had houses. They had wives. They had mother-in-laws. They had kids. But when you followed a rabbi, there were times when you went off to be taught, and there's times you came home. Watch. Then the disciples, okay. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. Remember, they left and went back to their home. Now, when they got to their home, they got to thinking, they're going, they did this to blame it on us. Well, I'll show you. And so after they leave, she looks in there. She sees two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? <laughs> I think that's crazy. She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Let me tell you something. This might hit hard. Uh, he's been crucified, and there ain't but one woman 
that went to finish the job. Peter and John didn't go to help her finish the body. Was it too much to ask? Because they would have been determined unclean. They'd had to go get baptized through the mikvah. Where's his mama? Where's his sisters? Where's his brothers? One woman? She had to go get Peter and John. They weren't with her. Let me tell you something. If you get through this life with one friend, you should cherish that friend. I'm going to say this because he ain't here. But on Rocky Banks' birthday vacation, he bought me a gift. That's a person that's thinking about you when you would think they're thinking about themselves. I want you to let that Blow your mind. Oh, where's the blind people he healed? Where's the people he raised from the dead? Where's Jairus' daughter? Where's Jairus? Where's the centurion that he healed his servant? Where's the guy that laid 38 years blind? Where's the guy that laid 38 years crippled by the pool of Siloam? Where are they at? Where's Lazarus? I think Lazarus is dead. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. You know what she's wondering? She wants to know where they laid him. Don't miss that. Because the dump was called Guyana. It's a word used for hell because the fire never went out. And most people in that town got thrown in that fire because they couldn't afford a burial. And if you were going to grave rob somebody, you would take that body and throw it in Guyana as quick as you could to get rid of the evidence. Do you think that's going through her head? I don't know where they've laid my Lord. Did they take him and throw him in the town place where you dispose of bodies? Surely she don't think they have him in some pristine palace. Watch it. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. How come she didn't know it was Jesus? How come she don't recognize Jesus? How come Peter don't recognize Jesus on the shore? How come the disciples uh, talk amongst themselves on the shore when he cooks them from some fish and the Bible says they talked amongst each other and they thought it was the Lord but they weren't sure. Does he look different? He retains the scars in his hands and feet and side. Does he not retain the rest of the scars? Is his face so disfigured that they don't recognize him? I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seeketh thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto her, Sir, if thou hast borne him, if you've taken him, if you've carried him, borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni. It means teacher, rabbi, which is to say master. Did she recognize his voice finally? Did he take some kind of covering off? I don't know. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then, remember they went to their homes. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, well, when is this? Well, remember, she's at the tomb and it's still dark. But this is the first day of the week, so before the sun went down, Somewhere in here in the afternoon, they all gathered together. Watch it. 
Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, why were they all assembled there? I thought they went to their homes. No, by the afternoon they all assembled in one place for fear of the Jews. They thought they was going to frame them. They was going to come and get them. In that room came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, it wasn't the Holy Ghost they received on the day of Pentecost, but they received the Holy Ghost right then. Now, look at Acts 12, verse 1 through 11. We're going to solve this problem. The King James Bible calls this word Pasha uh, Easter. It's virtually the only Bible that has the word Easter in it. Everybody poo-poos the King James Bible. The word Pasha is Passover. It's translated Passover everywhere else in the Bible. But the King James translators made a mistake in this story and called it Easter. Well, uh, Martin Luther's Bible that he wrote, he interpreted Pasha as Easter every time the word's in the book. So before you go to poo-pooing something, you need to understand what's going on. I'm going to teach you tonight, and then you'll know. Watch. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. Now, this is Herod, right? And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. That's why we know that the writer of James was killed early on. Probably one of the first martyrs. Now, some people think that the James that wrote the book was the brother, half-brother of Jesus, James, the become the pastor of Jerusalem. I don't believe that. This James was in the inner circle of Jesus' disciples, Peter, James, and John. He writes his book to the uh, Jews that were scattered, the 12 tribes that were scattered. When was they scattered? Early on. Okay, so here we go. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Now, when did he take Peter? So he killed James, cut his head off. Who did? Herod, the king of Israel. But Herod was not a Jew. Herod was placed there by Rome. Herod was a pagan Roman. He was the king of Israel. Israel don't kill people by cutting their heads off. They stone them to death. Herod was not a Jew. Herod did not observe Passover. He celebrated Easter. Herod was not a Jew. He didn't have a Passover lamb. He didn't have a Sabbath. He didn't have a Passover Seder. He didn't have a Passover meal. He didn't teach his kids about them coming out of Egypt. He didn't come out of Egypt. He was a pagan. He celebrated sex. He married his brother's wife. He killed his own family. He's not celebrating Passover. He's celebrating Easter's. Watch it. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Parentheses. Then was the days of unleavened bread. So I've just taught you over and over and over. I tried to drive it home. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the seven days after Passover. Now we don't know when Peter was taken, but we know that it was in the feast of the unleavened bread. How was Herod able to arrest him? Because it's a mandatory feast. 
Peter had to come to Jerusalem. If Peter lived in another town, we don't know, but every Jew is in Jerusalem on Passover. But he was not arrested on Passover. He was arrested sometimes in the seven-day week of unleavened bread. Is that clear? So when he got arrested, he's, Passover's over. Watch the next verse. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Here's the dilemma, and they wrote extensively about it. The translators of the King James Bible had a dilemma. The word is pasha. Remember, it's a copper-headed rattle moxkin. Well, Pasha is translated Passover everywhere else. But they said, in the context, it can't be Passover because it just the Bible just tells you it's in the week of unleavened bread. And then they said, Herod's not observing Passover anyway. He's observing Easter. So I believe they were led by the Holy Spirit and they said, it's, it's Easter so he intended after Easter, listen, Herod had uh, eggs to color and he had grandkids to hunt eggs and stuff. And Easter was a big feast back then. It's a lot different than it is now. It was a bunch of sex and debauchery and it's a party time. I don't have time to cut this guy's head off and make a big deal about that. That's why the words put in there so he intended after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. Now, you can say, maybe it's talking about next year's Easter or next year's Passover. I don't think so. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Prayer works, people. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. He's locked up pretty good. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side. Do you think Peter's worried? He's sound asleep. And he raised him up saying, Rise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. I do not have any idea why he has to move quickly. Except, the only thing I can think of is the angel didn't want to have to kill them all. Some of them probably believed when they come up out of their slumber and he was gone. But if he would have awoken them, the angel would have had to kill them all. It's the only thing I can think of. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals and so he did, and he saith unto him, Cast thy garments about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them, had some kind of power gate of his own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod. And from all the expectations of the people of the Jews. So, here's what I believe. I believe he was crucified on our Wednesday afternoon. The 14th day of Nisan. So if that's the 14th day, then we got to go back four days. One, two, three, four. And so sometime in here is when he rode in on a baby donkey. Because remember, on the 10th day of the month, you had to take a lamb and... You had to sacrifice it. And I'm going to draw a little baby donkey.
on the Sabbath. So on the Sabbath, you count one, two, three, four. That's the 14th. So he didn't write in on Sunday, on Palm Sunday. No, he wrote in on Sabbath, on Saturday. Palm Sunday's a lie. He wasn't crucified on Friday. Okay, let's say he's crucified on Friday at 3 o'clock. That would be one night and a half a night. Or you might say three quarters, because we don't know when, but we know it was before the sun come up. Well, Jesus didn't say one and three quarters. He said three. Well, if he's crucified on Friday at three o'clock, the day's pretty much over. If he's out of the grave here when Mary gets there, that's just one day and three hours. Now listen, some of the greatest theologians that have ever lived puts this forth. What's the great preacher in California? John MacArthur? He preaches Friday crucifixion, Sunday morning resurrection. He is probably one of the greatest theologians of our time. The one that he honors and looks up to is R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul preaches Friday crucifixion, Sunday morning resurrection. That's only one day and a little bit. It's not even close to three. It's not two and three quarters. It's not two and five eighths. Some people teach Thursday. Okay, let's look at Thursday. Then you would have one night, two nights, and a half. It's not two and a half. It's three. If, you, if you're crucified on Thursday at three, you got one day, two day, and a little bit. It's not two and a little bit. He died on Wednesday at three. It's one day, two days, three days. He died Wednesday at three. It's one night, two nights, three nights. He didn't come in on Sunday, came in on Saturday. The whole thing's a lie. But if I was the devil, I'd lie too, wouldn't you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these people. God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the revelation. We thank you for the word that's clear that we can know if we study if we prepare ourselves, we talked about it in the five o'clock class. We're to prepare ourselves with the gospel to give to other people, help us in a loving way, in a caring way, share the gospel with people. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks.